Benitez, wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, extreme weather coast to coast. Oh my God, dude. From tornadoes to devastating heat taking a toll on millions, we're covering the extreme weather impacting the country and the devastating results when we took a dive off of the Florida coast. Plus, what keeps you up at night? Technical surprise. And that could be adversary technical surprise or extraterrestrial technical surprise. In his first exclusive TV interview, we speak with the man tasked with chasing down all those UFO claims that have ramped up year after year and try to answer the question, will we ever see proof of extraterrestrials in our lifetimes? And... You know, I was a white person in hip hop now. Like, it's, I, I get to contribute to a culture that I grew up in and that I have a great love and respect for. And I'm very appreciative and, you know, grateful for, like, all that I've gotten to, you know, do in this space. Hip-hop and rap started in black and brown communities, and it's gone global. Now some of the biggest faces of the genre breaking into the field encounter accusations of racial and cultural appropriation. We bring you the growing world of so-called white rap. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including impending federal charges that could be handed down against former President Trump as his aide makes a grand jury appearance just hours ago. Plus, the NFL approves the sale of the Washington Commanders the same day its owner is hit with allegations he improperly hid finances and inappropriately touched a cheerleader. And the Women's World Cup is kicking off in New Zealand. We're there for a look as America prepares for its very first match. Our correspondents are fanned out around the world covering those stories and much more for us tonight. But we do begin once again with a severe weather threat and the extremes worldwide. Today, Europe's Climate Change Service confirmed the first two weeks of July were likely the hottest two weeks ever recorded in history. And tonight, Greece is just the latest country to face those massive wildfires. We'll take you there in a moment. Here at home, that relentless and dangerous heat is not loosening its grip. More than 100 million Americans remain under heat alerts. And all that heat is destroying Florida's crown jewel, its coral reefs. Ginger will have more on that in a moment. We begin with our Trevor Alton, North Carolina, where cleanup is just beginning after a devastating EF3 tornado destroyed a Pfizer plant and rip roofs right off of homes. Tonight, terrifying new video showing the moment the roof peeled off this home. Seconds later, a neighbor's home flying by as that EF3 tornado bore down on families outside Raleigh, North Carolina Wednesday. Packing 150 mile an hour winds. That twister up to six football fields wide on the ground for more than half an hour. In 150 mile an hour winds, some of these homes never stood a chance, and the power lines certainly didn't either. This was a 16 mile path of destruction. You see, there's dozens of vehicles just in this spot. It is a gigantic effort to get the power back on. I'm scared. All of us were scared. Pat Smith was golfing and caught in a cart when the tornado roared through. A tree fell behind us, and then it started falling everywhere. And we just ducked down. You can't really remember much, you know what I mean? You're scared to death. The twister plowing into this Pfizer plant in Rocky Mount. The plant is responsible for producing nearly 25% of Pfizer's sterile injectables used in U.S. hospitals. Pfizer CEO tweeting, we are working urgently to determine the best way to get back online as quickly as possible while ensuring the safety of our people. That people are certainly relying on them to get back online. Trevor all joins us now from North Carolina. Trevor, what are the impacts of this Pfizer plant being out of commission for the foreseeable future? Yeah, so, Lindsay, this is an enormous manufacturing plant for Pfizer and for the nation at large. According to Pfizer, it ships out 200 million units a year of drugs like anesthesia, medications that fight infections. And now the fact that this plant has been basically destroyed by this tornado, there's new concerns there's going to be an actual drug shortage, especially in hospitals. That's how big and important this plant is. Lindsay. All right, Trevor, all for us, our thanks to you. 
Calls for change in South Florida after a farm worker died while working in the excruciating heat. According to ABC's partner station WPLG, Efrain Lopez Garcia was found unresponsive and later pronounced dead. Friends and loved ones say Lopez Garcia had complained about feeling sick during a recent shift out in the heat. This is one of at least two farm workers suspected to have died from being exposed to extreme heat in recent weeks. And as a record number of Americans visit Europe this summer, temperatures there are soaring. In Greece, wildfires burn in the suburbs of Athens, forcing evacuations. Firefighters from across the continent have come in to help. Our Marcus Moore reports from Athens, Greece tonight. Tonight, the dangerous heat wave spreading across Europe as extreme temperatures fuel wildfires in Greece. We're just outside Athens, where it's been hovering around 110 degrees. They are still very much in this fight, not only from the air, but also on the ground. This fire popping up just a short time ago along this road leading to villages here. We meet Maria Valavani hurrying to make sure her grandmother was okay. You're obviously worried about them. You were worried about them. Of course. We're my relatives and friends here. Her grandmother, like so many others here, lost her home, but is unhurt. Atmospheric conditions trapping multiple heat domes across the center of the earth, sending temperatures soaring here in southern Europe. And it's becoming a deadly trend. Scientists estimate more than 61,000 deaths on the continent last summer could have been heat related. Highs now reaching 114 in Spain. In Italy, Sicily hitting 115 degrees in recent days. The usually bustling streets of Sardinia mostly empty. People trying to stay inside in the shade. Marcus Moore joins us now from Greece. Marcus, is there any relief in sight? Well, uh, at this point, Lindsay, uh, not in the next couple of days because temperatures are expected to reach 113 degrees by Sunday. Then there may be a short break in the temperatures by Monday. But then after that, there's concern for this heat streak to continue. Lindsay. All right, Marcus Moore for us. Thanks so much. Former President Trump could face yet another federal indictment at any moment as the special counsel investigates possible efforts to overturn the election. Today, the grand jury heard from at least one witness, an aide who was with Trump on January 6th. ABC's Terry Moran is in Washington. Prosecutors with special counsel Jack Smith's office arriving this morning at the federal courthouse in Washington as the grand jury investigating former President Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election heard from another witness, current Trump aide Will Russell. In the target letter Trump received from prosecutors, he was given until today to testify before the grand jury himself. He didn't. And so an indictment is likely imminent any day now. Sources tell ABC News that target letter mentioned three federal crimes Trump could be charged with. Conspiracy to commit an offense against or to defraud the United States. Obstruction of an official proceeding. And conspiracy to deprive people of rights. A civil rights law that the Justice Department policy manual says should be considered when addressing schemes to thwart voting in federal elections. Terry Moran joins us now from Washington. Terry, former President Donald Trump had until today to testify before the grand jury. That did not happen. The grand jury has now gone home for the night. What can we expect next? What comes next now, Lindsay, is that prosecutors at some point will inform the grand jurors that they have completed presenting the evidence on these charges. That could already have happened. And then the grand jurors will deliberate and vote. It doesn't have to be unanimous, unanimous on that question, uh, should Donald Trump be indicted on these crimes? And all of that could happen as soon as tomorrow. Lindsay? All right, Terry Moran, we'll be following it. Thanks so much. As the investigation into allegations of inhumane treatment against migrants at the border continues, New York City will distribute flyers at the U.S.-Mexico border telling newly arrived migrants to, quote, consider another city and limit shelter stays to adult asylum seekers to 60 days. The flyer plans to highlight the high cost of housing, food, and other necessities that migrants will encounter if they travel to the U.S. Financial Center. In New York City, an agreement has been made to pay more than $13 million in a historic civil rights lawsuit on behalf of 13 people who were arrested or beaten by police during the summer of 2020. The suit focused on the protests that erupted the week following the law enforcement killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Police who were arrested or subjected to force by the NYPD will each be eligible for almost $10,000, according to the plaintiff's attorneys. If the settlement is approved by a judge, this would be the most expensive payout ever awarded in a lawsuit over mass arrests. North Korea is warning that the arrival of a U.S. nuclear-armed submarine in South Korea 
Korea could justify them responding with nuclear weapons. It comes as U.S. officials are investigating the circumstances of that American soldier who ran across the DMZ and is now in the custody of North Korea. ABC's chief global affairs correspondent Martha Raddatz is in South Korea with an exclusive look inside the USS Kentucky. It is this U.S. nuclear-armed ballistic missile submarine now docked in South Korea for the first time in 40 years that is prompting North Korea tonight to issue a dire warning, claiming they now have the legal right to launch their own nuclear weapons. We got an exclusive look at the USS Kentucky, the most destructive warship on the planet. The Navy will not say publicly that there are nuclear weapons on board this submarine, but make no mistake, I am standing on top of hundreds of nuclear warheads. This is our missile control center. The commander taking me inside the missile control center. So this is where nuclear missiles would be launched from? Yes. Recommend grabbing onto this handhold. Then showing us where at least 20 crew, ballistic missiles are housed, each carrying up to a dozen nuclear warheads. A major deterrent, says the U.S., in the wake of North Korea's nuclear saber rattling. Are you worried about the possibility it could backfire? I am very confident in our own nuclear deterrence. This, while well, tonight, Army counterintelligence investigating the circumstances of Army Private Travis King's decision to bolt across the border into North Korea while on a tour of the demilitarized zone. We don't know his condition. We don't know um, where he's being held. We don't know um, the status of his health. The Pentagon saying they do not have any indication King's border rush was pre-planned with the North Koreans. Martha Raddatz joins us now from South Korea. Martha, that was some incredible reporting from inside the submarine. But regarding the nuclear warning from North Korea, how is the U.S. responding? Well, the U.S. is responding to North Korea's new threat, saying that unlike North Korea's actions, the U.S. efforts to improve the defense posture and protect citizens with that submarine is not in violation of U.N. Security Council resolutions. Lindsay? Martha Raddatz for us, reporting from South Korea. Thanks so much, Martha. Staying overseas in Ukraine tonight, U.S. officials have confirmed that American-made cluster munitions are now in use on the front lines and as Russia has stepped up its retaliatory strikes on Ukrainian ports. At least three civilians were killed overnight. ABC's James Longman is with Ukrainian forces who say that U.S. equipment is saving their lives. Tonight, the Pentagon confirms Ukraine is using U.S. cluster munitions for the first time on the battlefield against entrenched Russian forces. At this rear position in southern Ukraine, more American weaponry is ready for deployment. This is the U.S. made Bradley. It's a piece of equipment that Ukraine values really, really highly in this counteroffensive because it keeps its men safe whilst being able to go on the attack. The armor is much more effective, says this operator, than the Soviet equivalent. If it wasn't for this type of vehicle, he says, I wouldn't be speaking to you right now. And there's more U.S. artillery here. The Paladin is a piece of precision artillery kit that can fire at targets up to 15 miles away. U.S. cluster munitions now part of its ammunition supply. He's explaining just from this little piece of paper. He's saying that's the Ukrainians and the Russians fire and they miss repeatedly. This piece of kit, in return, only takes two or three efforts to try to hit the target. That's why having U.S. equipment is so valuable to Ukraine. Ukraine needs all the help it can get. Russia pounded cities in the south with missiles and drones for a third consecutive night, targeting grain export facilities again. They're really going for the jugular, going after that grain. James Longman joins us now from Ukraine. James, the White House has a new warning tonight for Russia. Yeah, that's right, Lindsay. It does feel like things are escalating over this uh, grain shipment issue. The White House warned that the Kremlin has now mined sea routes and may be setting the stage for attacks on grain shipments. Ukraine has now said they will now also view any ship that's heading into a Russian-controlled port as a legitimate military target. A tense time. Lindsay? Intense indeed. All right. James Longman reporting in from Kiev, Ukraine for us tonight. Thanks, James. The Washington Commanders are no longer owned by Dan Snyder. During a special session, NFL owners voted to unanimously approve the team's sale from the Snyder family to a group led by Josh Harris. The Harris Group is paying just over $6 billion, a record sum for a North American sports franchise. Snyder owned the majority of the Commanders since 1999, and his family became the sole owners after he bought out his limited partners two years ago. 
The temperatures of the ocean are soaring off the coast of Florida, hitting well over 90 degrees. It's devastating and deadly to the coral and marine life there and could have dire implications for us all. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z has the latest. The Florida Keys baking in weeks of record heat. It's like this heat wave never ends. July will be their hottest on record, and it's not just the air. The water is sweltering too. The temperature of the ocean around the Keys is up to seven degrees above average. We're not even close to what the previous record was, let alone the average. Water that hot can definitely supercharge hurricanes, but it can also be fatal for Florida's vital coral reef. Just a few miles offshore and 20 to 30 feet under the surface of the sea, you'll find more than 80 species of coral, an animal that builds a rock-like exoskeleton, creating a line of defense, protecting the keys from hurricanes. But if we didn't have this spur and groove reef system right off the coast of the keys, these islands would be decimated. It's also home to important creatures crucial to the economy. Between tourism and commercial fishing, the reef brings Florida billions in revenue. Over the last four decades, Florida's reef has lost more than 90% of its live cover to hurricanes, pollution, and constant warming. They've hit the tipping point. Carrie O'Neill and her team at the Florida Aquarium have been helping rehabilitate Florida's reef by breeding coral to withstand a warming climate, raising baby coral in their ocean greenhouse. Four years ago, they planted 200 baby coral on this spot, and they've been thriving ever since. So the team came out to monitor this site a few weeks ago, and the corals were looking pretty good. But our water temperatures at that time were 91 degrees on the, on the dive computer. So that's concerning. But now, with water this hot, this long, and this early, the coral can die fast. And what does it look like? It'll really just look white, a very, very pale. Uh -huh. Here we go. Here we go. Within seconds, we saw it, stark white. The coral is bleached. Immediately when we went in, you saw white. Yeah. Um, I mean, big patches. Uh, as soon as I put my face in the water, my heart dropped into my stomach, for sure. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a lot of work to be lost in 10 days. We need to take action to stop the warming of our planet or else scientists like myself will just constantly be trying to keep up with it and keep us from losing species entirely. I think one of the most stunning things I learned is Carrie said that there are 3,000 year old coral that have withstood the changes over time, but that this bleaching event, the last 10 days, has taken them out. Now, this is one of the observation stations that has been recording those unprecedented heat levels in the ocean. But most of these marine scientists say you don't even need that data. The coral is telling us the story. They are very motivated, Lindsay, to get back in the lab and try to make another coral even more heat resistant. Such meaningful and important reporting there, Ginger. Thank you. Still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. A mother is accused of hiring a hitman to kill her three-year-old child. How police discovered the alleged plot. And he's a standout NBA all-star, but Jalen Brown tells us how he is driving social justice change off the court. But next, have you ever seen something in the sky that you just can't quite explain? Unidentified flying objects are a global fixation. In our Prime Focus, an exclusive first look at the Pentagon's efforts to find answers. You believe them. I believe that they believe what they're telling me. And I, my job is not to, it's not a question of belief, right? It's a question of what can I go research? Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story, 
here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. Unidentified flying objects have been an obsession for decades, spawning speculation and wild conspiracy theories. But are any of these mysterious UFO sightings proof of life beyond Earth? Tonight, after generations of investigation and theories, the government is pulling back the curtain, trying to separate fact from fiction. And in our prime focus, we have an exclusive first look inside the Pentagon's new effort to find answers and the first TV interview with the man tasked with running it all. Our Devin Dwyer reports. Oh my gosh, dude. After decades of mysterious sightings, the Pentagon's top UFO investigator speaking exclusively to ABC News. What surprised you most since you took over? There are a number of things that surprised me. The government probe covering hundreds of unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAP, like this declassified U.S. Navy video. Oh my gosh, dude. The unusual object flying quickly through restricted airspace off the East Coast in 2015. Some phenomena shocking everyday Americans, too. I swear to God, this is not a joke. A Las Vegas family last month called 911. Adam and extraterrestrial creatures had landed in their backyard. They're like nine foot, ten foot tall. They look like aliens to us. These are retrieving non-human origin uh, technical vehicles. One whistleblower is so convinced, he says the government has pieces of alien spacecraft under lock and key. Yeah, they're sophisticatedly engineered, um, certainly not by humans. And Hollywood is feeding the fascination. She has arrived. Now that's a proper introduction. So do aliens exist? And are those unidentified aerial phenomena evidence they visited Earth? To separate fact from fiction, we went to the man leading a search for answers from inside the Pentagon. I'm a long-term intelligence officer, scientist, and military officer. Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, in his first television interview after a year on the job, told us everything is on the table. What keeps you up at night? Technical surprise. And that could be adversary technical surprise or extraterrestrial technical surprise. Kirkpatrick leads the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or ARO, created by Congress last year to detect, identify, and attribute mysterious objects of interest in the air, in outer space, and even underwater. It's a big job. Yes. The top priorities, he says, are mitigating threats to the safety of military personnel and dispelling myths. What's the most common misconception people have of UAPs or of the work you're doing? That they're all the same thing and they're all extraterrestrial. Um, and neither of those are true. His office is investigating more than 800 cases of potential UAPs reported by military pilots and service members. Things like this video from 2019, Navy sailors recording glowing triangles above them, now believed to be ordinary drones distorted by night vision goggles. Many reports involve unusual metallic spheres seen floating in the sky, but most have been later identified as weather or spy balloons. We have to go through the, the rigor of 
taking each one, matching it against our known objects and known catalogs, and then reviewing that, peer reviewing that, making sure that everybody's in agreement. But there's not an explanation for everything, most notably the so-called Tic Tac incident off the California coast in 2004. I can tell you, I, I think it was not from this world. David Fravor is a retired Navy F-18 pilot who spotted the object, seeming to move at impossible speeds. He spoke with ABC News in 2017. We get a call from USS Princeton. He gives us a bearing range and altitude report. He's calling a contact for us that they want us to investigate. So as we start driving out there, so I said, what are we looking for? And he said, we don't know. He said, we've seen these objects, and they hang out at 20,000, then they go straight back up above 80,000 and disappear. There's two people in each jet, so four heads, eight eyeballs, and we start looking around. And right about that time, I was like, dude, do you see that? I go, what is that? So we're looking down, and there's a disturbance in the water. Right next to it was this little white object that looks like a Tic Tac, and it's just above the surface of the water. And it's moving around left, right, forward, back, just random, no controlled thing. There is no rotor wash, there is no jet wash. I say, hey, I'm gonna go down and check it out. We start coming down, so now we're in a clockwise flow, going from 12 to three, and it starts going from six to nine. And it's coming up, and we're going down. We start to cut across, it rapidly accelerates, climbs past our altitude and disappears. That's the last we saw of it. What's your best guess of what happened there? It's really hard to guess on this, and, and I don't like to guess. So have you hit a dead end with this one then? The more things that I see that resemble a Tic Tac, then I can get more and more information about what that is. Kirkpatrick says between 95 and 98% of cases reviewed by his office are readily explainable. Large birds, balloons, debris, or drones, but a small number remain a mystery. So that two to five percent, which are anomalous incidents, which you're still looking into, could potentially be extraterrestrial activity? So we are going to follow our data and our investigations wherever it goes, right? So I, I have a full range of hypotheses. So you can't rule it out? I can't rule it out, but I don't have any evidence that says that yet. Most Americans believe intelligent life exists beyond Earth, and a majority say UAPs under investigation are likely proof of contact. Some former Pentagon insiders claim the government has more evidence than it's publicly acknowledged. Kirkpatrick says he's seen nothing to back up those claims. You can say categorically you've seen no convincing, I have seen confirmable no evidence convincing. of intact spacecraft kept by the U.S. government. No. I have seen nothing that leads me to that conclusion. Is it possible there is some secret program that you're just not aware of? I don't think so. I have access to anything and everything I need. Why do you think these whistleblowers are coming forward? Well, one, I think the recent law, which extended whistleblower protections to them and, and named Arrow as the author, authorized disclosure authority, uh, opens the door for them to, to come and tell us exactly what they think they, they saw or know about. You believe them? I believe that they believe what they're telling me, and I, my job is not to, it's not a question of belief, right? It's a question of what can I go research? Investigating UAPs has bipartisan support on Capitol Hill. My priority is that we understand the full range of threats posed by our adversaries in all domains. Multiple congressional committees have held hearings. There is something there measurable by multiple instruments, and yet it seems to move in directions that are inconsistent with what we know of physics or science uh, more broadly. And even the White House now weighing in. We're not saying what they are or what they're not. We're saying that there's something our pilots are seeing. We're saying it has had an effect on some of our training operations, and so we want to get to the bottom of it. Top Democrats and Republicans have called for greater transparency, proposing legislation this month that would force the government to publicly release records on UAPs within 25 years of when they were created. So a lot of these allegations crop up again and again over history. I mean, do you think extraterrestrial life is out there? I think it's statistically unrealistic to think it isn't. I mean, given, given the vastness of the universe. Are you going to find it on your watch? Well, wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> I mean, that would be probably the best outcome of this job. 
Would that be fun or scary? Our thanks to Devin for that. Still much more to get to tonight on Prime. Coming up, a legal battle over a toddler burned by hot chicken nuggets. How much a jury awarded her family in a suit against McDonald's. And hip hop was created by black artists, but many of the rappers who gained fame from it are white. Their presence often raises questions about whether you can participate in the craft without appropriating it. We speak to artists about that fine line. Because where I grew up was country as, as could be, but it was 50% black, 50% white. So right off top, there's the connection, you know what I'm saying? Because hip hop is, you know, rooted in, in started by black and brown people. But next, some of the best soccer players in the world are convening for the Women's World Cup. We take a look at the contenders and the favorites to win by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I came out of jail with a plan. I was going to put every piece of energy I had into music. Give it up for Jelly Roll! Somebody if I wasn't a musician, I'd be dead. This was my best bet to really have an impact. <laughs> I'll cry with you. Who would have thought I could help people? I needed help, you know? I still need help. Somebody save me. I love you. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is OK. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, OK, who's the target? And how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This this is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. 
Welcome back, everyone. The Women's World Cup is now underway, and as the players take to the fields in New Zealand and Australia, we have a look at the contenders, the favorites, and more by the numbers. The U.S. team will be fighting for their third consecutive win, and virtually every sports book is in agreement that the team is likely to get it. England, Germany, and Spain are considered to be their fiercest competition. The U.S. roster is the most diverse that it's ever been, with nine players of color and a blend of races, ethnicities, and sexual orientation that more closely reflects the country than what's often seen on suburban soccer fields. They'll be facing a record 32 nations for the world title after FIFA expanded the competition to give more countries a chance to experience the sport's global showpiece. The eight newcomers are Haiti, Ireland, Morocco, Panama, Philippines, Portugal, Vietnam, and Zambia. FIFA reports 1.12 billion viewers watched the 2019 Women's World Cup on TV or online. That was a record audience for the event, and it's widely expected to exceed 2 billion this year, yet Women's Cup players will earn on average just 25 cents for every dollar the men earned at their World Cup last year. FIFA says that they're working to narrow the gender pay gap. It's an improvement on the less than 8 cents per dollar that they earned in the last Cup. The U.S. team's first game will be tomorrow night against one of those newcomers, Vietnam. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. United Airlines is getting rid of dozens of flights at a major hub. Why it's cutting down on the schedule? And and you've seen these at children's parties, but the appeal is expanding why more adults than ever are getting bouncy houses for themselves. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. A major settlement after a toddler's family says she was burned by chicken nuggets. United Airlines starts cutting flights from its schedule, and an activity usually meant for children finds a new life with adults. These stories and much more in tonight's Rundown. She became an adult just a few months ago, a mother three years ago, and a murder for hire suspect a few days ago, for which she is now free on bond. She's 18. She went on a website to hire a hitman. Jasmine Paez was given a suicide prevention vest in court. She's accused of hiring a hitman to target her own three-year-old son to, quoting police, take him far, far, far away and possibly killed and ASAP. Now is the child, the child is okay? It is doing great. And that grandma received official custody today. $15 million. That's what lawyers for the family of eight-year-old Olivia were requesting from a jury after she was severely burned by a chicken McNugget. Back when Olivia was four, her mom took her to a McDonald's drive through for a Happy Meal. When she handed the meal to Olivia in the back seat, a nugget fell, getting caught between her car seat and her thigh. She suffered second-degree burns. It came down to the jury, which took just two hours to decide the final number. The family will get $800,000. Olivia's mom, satisfied. United Airlines is cutting flights at its newer hub in an effort to prevent future meltdowns. United normally flies 435 flights out of Newark in the summer. This year, it is already down to 410, and in the fall, it will drop to 390. The airline's chief said they hope to make the schedule more manageable to mitigate weather events and other operating constraints at the airport. A tentative contract deal has been reached between theater workers and industry leaders. The International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, the Broadway League, and Disney Theatrical made the announcement. The sides came to terms after the theater workers union started voting on whether to authorize a strike. Since April 19th, Americans have been spending their dollars dreaming to be the next Powerball winner. But last night, we finally got a winner. One lucky player matched all six Powerball numbers, winning the grand prize, which had grown to $1.08 billion. The tickets sold here at Las Palmitas Mini Market in downtown LA. It's a new twist on an old pastime. Inside these inflatable walls, the only thing that matters is letting your inner child shine. I lost my socks three times. <laughs> Adults having a ball. Woo! Here at Big Bounce America, the world's largest bounce house, those with a little wear on the tires <laughs> transform into silly souls. I saw a lot of adults out here acting like kids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they thought they were kids again. Absolutely. And that's what we want. We want them to bring the inner kid out. I haven't stopped laughing for, like, you know, the last hour and a half, so. <laughs> that's great. Hip-hop's roots are firmly planted in black and brown communities, but the genre has gone global with some white artists at the helm, raising the question, how can these artists create and not appropriate? As ABC News Live marks 50 years of hip-hop, we're going inside the world of so-called white rap. Here's our Monaco Sarabdi. These days, I'm stuck. I look pretty good, but... Can I get this extra large right here? Bubba Sparks keeps a low profile in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. You know why I like this, though? Because you can wear that with pretty much anything. I ain't choose the rhyme. Rhyming chose me. Quite removed from the early 2000s when he shot to mainstream fame after his debut rap single, Ugly, perplexed the masses. His rural southern drawl mixing hip-hop with bluegrass and country. His rapid rise, even taking him by surprise. I had just done TRL, Total Request Live, in Manhattan in Times Square for the first time. I just noticed people started looking at me. All of a sudden, somebody said, that's him, that's Bubba Spark. People started chasing after us, and we started running. I was like, what the? I was like, He's like, it's because you're a star, man. And I was like, whoa. 
Born Warren Mathis, Bubba is introspective when talking about his career, the highs and the lows. Call it Paul Bubba Sparks. Particularly his hit 2006 single that would reach the Billboard Top 10, the club staple Miss New Booty from his album The Charm. If I hear Call it Park Bubba Sparks, Call it Park, Bubba immediately everybody's going to start singing Miss New Booty. Like no, it no. is ingrained in people's minds. And I have <laughs> such a love hate relationship with every aspect of that song. I would have never thought that that was going to be my defining record, or like some people would view it as such, but I would have never recorded the song. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Despite his conflicted feelings and self-identified shortcomings, Bubba did achieve success in hip-hop, commercial exposure that his non-white peers find harder to come by. Do you think it was easier for you because you're white? In some ways, in some ways more difficult. This is the way I always say it. As a white boy, there's certain doors that being white that you'll automatically get in that perhaps no black person or, or other race could ever get in. But there's also certain doors as a white boy that you can never get in, no matter what. Like, it's just, you know, certain people are just never gonna check for a white rapper, period. Hip hop is and has been a cultural movement. Born in New York out of black and brown communities, it's a lifestyle centered in art, politics, and most of all, music. Now what you hear is not a test, I'm rapping to the beat. The development from a New York culture to an East Coast, here comes the West Coast, the difference that that made. We would have to talk about Run DMC and LL Cool J and Eric B and Rakim, and then Ice T, Ice Cube and NWA. But as the genre spread in the late 80s and hip hop entered its golden era, a punk band of three middle class teenagers would drop the first hip hop album to reach number one on the charts. You gotta fight! The Beastie Boys burst onto the scene, releasing License to Ill in 1986, a mainstream success that would eventually become certified diamond. The Beastie Boys were a really interesting thing because we were very urban, it was very black, they were Lower East Side, New York, born and bred, but punk kids who liked hip hop, right? And there is a sonic relationship between punk and hip hop. And for a lot of people, the Beastie Boys are a gateway drug. They brought a lot of white fans in who love the Beasties and then become genuine fans of other artists. By the 90s, hip hop had transcended its epicenter with hubs in the West Coast and the Deep South. All right, stop, collaborate and listen. But one particular rapper would scale the charts, making hip hop history with the first song in the genre to top the Billboard Hot 100, Vanilla Ice. Vanilla Ice, real name Robert Van Winkle, was a commercial success. To rap purists, he was a white artist appropriating a culture and black art form, often touting his street adjacent upbringing. It was clearly a pop music play rather than trying. The Beastie Boys seemed to be wanting to be part of hip hop culture and the hip hop community. Vanilla Ice was clearly not. Well, since he's 12, Fast forward to the rise of Eminem, who dominated the charts, eventually becoming the best-selling rapper of all time. His career, beginning with My Name Is. My name is My name is My name is Eminem's an interesting case because he is extraordinarily talented as an MC. He cares deeply about the culture. At the same time, um, he definitely enters with a pop mindset. With his signature bleach blonde hair, baggy white t-shirts, and self-deprecating lyrics, Eminem was an anomaly. But by his side was a familiar face, Dr. Dre, years removed from his days with N.W.A. There was this understanding that we want to have some, it's almost like a sponsor, some noted black person will be standing beside you. Eminem's success as a rapper is unmatchable with a litany of platinum selling albums, accolades, and a committed fan base. His lyrical prowess and his MC skills garnered him respect and acceptance in hip hop. Yet many point out that it is impossible to separate the Detroit born rapper's immense fame and accomplishments from his race. There's no doubt that him being white contributed largely to his success. It was a big, it was a factor. But dude's also beyond incredible. The widespread popularity of hip hop has raised questions about who can and should thrive in a space created by black and brown artists. The conversation fueled by record companies driven by album sales. Look, 
In the 80s, the majority of hip hop fans were urban black kids. In the early 90s, it starts to shift and it becomes suburban white boys. And the music industry shifts to cater to what they want. The disparity most notable in the Grammys. In 2014, controversy stirred when Macklemore beat out Kendrick Lamar for best rap album. Macklemore then texting Kendrick post-show, you got robbed, I wanted you to win. The Grammys is dominated by white voters, especially white voters who love rock and roll and to a certain extent, pop music. It has been 20 years since a act of modern hip hop or R&B has won the album of the year Grammy. There's a privilege that I'm very aware of, you know, as a white man in America, period. You know, at the end of the day, doing things with true intention and for the right reasons, with integrity, you know, is the place I come from. Oakland native G-Eazy was just 13 when he began writing his first rhymes. Growing up in the Bay Area, it's a very unique, special place culturally with a lot of history. But, um, you know, hip hop was just the culture I was surrounded by, what I like was immersed in and grew up in. Coming to age at the height of the Bay Area's hyphy movement. Who were some of the rappers that you aspired to be, but also just grew up on their music? Yeah, the Bay has like a long lineage of, you know, pioneers and icons like that, you know, like growing up on 40, growing up on Too Short, growing up on Mac Dre, Kick the Sneak, Mr. Fab. g Easy, who doesn't mind going by his birth name Gerald or simply G, says his rise to fame was a long road. I mean, it's surreal when you go from crowds of like 50 people, 100 people, to now there's, you know, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. It feels good to be recognized like that. g Easy's first full album was 2012's Must Be Nice. After touring with 2 Chains, he released his first major label album, These Things Happen, and headlined his first international tour. His style earned him collaborations with some of pop music's biggest stars. But I need you and I can take you all the way and I'm able. Yet he hasn't stopped paying homage to his Bay Area roots and the artists that paved the way. E-40's been on every single album I put out. Like, I fell in love with this as a fan, as, you know, somebody who's in love with this culture, in love with this art form. Since its inception, leading with authenticity has been the cardinal rule of hip-hop, connecting modern artists with the old-school greats. I mean, hip-hop is pop culture. It's the driving force of popular music, period. You know, like, from country to pop, it's like hip-hop infused. There's this conception or perception of the the word country and country culture, that means automatically white. I never looked at it that way, because where I grew up was country as, as could be, but it was 50% black, 50% white. So right off top, there's the connection, you know what I'm saying? Because hip hop is, you know, rooted in, in started by black and brown people. I was a white person in hip hop now. Like, it's, I, I get to contribute to a culture that I grew up in and that I have a great love and respect for. And I'm very appreciative and grateful for like all that I've gotten to, you know, do in this space. An art embraced by so many, our thanks to Mona for that. Our next guest is a two-time NBA All-Star for the Boston Celtics, but when Jalen Brown is not driving to the basket, he's driving social justice change off of the court. We want to welcome Jalen to the studio. How are you? Hey, Lindsay, how are you? I am well. All right, so you founded the Juice Foundation, right? It's really meant to provide opportunities for those underserved youth in black and brown communities in particular. Give us some more of a, of a sense of your mission. Uh, it's centered around leadership and activism, but also mental health and wellness, and also sustainability and environmental health as well. It's just trying to take those three pillars and trying to put some positive energy back into the community. Uh, I got a sense of community. I'm all about community, so um, Juice is just energy, and that's what it stands for, the Juice Foundation. And, and I was just curious, in particular, you have the five-day program for uh, high school students in the Boston area that partners with MIT. What kind of programs does that focus on? Yes, Bridge. Uh, this is our third year Bridge. The first year was uh, virtual because of COVID. Mm -hmm. Last year was in Berkeley. This year, I'm excited to announce that we collaborated with MIT and the Media Lab. Um, to be the host of the Bridge program. It's basically like a summer camp with like without basketball. It's, it's centered around science, technology, engineering, and math, but also leadership, activism, um, art, 
um, culture, um, et cetera. Just trying to give, you know, students that come from disadvantaged communities the resources that they properly deserve. You have a quote on your website that I think is so profound and powerful, and I just want to read the quote here. You say, uh, the kids who have contributions to make but are stumped by lack of opportunity, I'll forever fight for those kids because I am one of them. What were some of the outlets that you had growing up outside of, of basketball? Uh, I was able to have a, a great sense of mentors and uh, community centers that I kind of relied on, but depending on where your zip code is can determine your, your future and your social mobility. Um, in this in this country, you know, that's the idea of American education system. So being able to to provide resources for kids who get forgotten about because, you know, those resources are allocated to those areas and those neighborhoods um, is something that I, I became passionate about because obviously I'm one of those kids that comes from those those lack of resources, those lack of opportunities. And I had a lot of things go right for me to get here. Um, some students don't have that same opportunity. So I want to give them all the chances in the world to become who they are intended to be. Uh, of course, you know, the Bible talks about to whom much is given, much is required. And I'm curious for you why it is that you go that extra mile. I've heard you talk before about how you wanted to use your platform with the NBA for good. But a lot of people have large platforms within the NBA or beyond, and, and they really don't do much to reach back. So what is it about you that, that makes that difference? Uh, I think it's just, you know, it's just in my design, you know, I think our God gave me this opportunity, this platform to be able to make a difference. And I, I take that uh, responsibility very seriously. I think that our next generation is pivotal. I think as, as, as our society and community continues to evolve, it's up to the people of influence to continue to try to push things forward. So for me, it's like I'll, I'll give everything to, to make this world a better place. Um, so I pride myself in using my platform to the utmost ability. For your vision five years from now with regard to the Juice Foundation, what is your greatest hope for it? Um, my greatest hope is to continue to launch Bridge. I think Bridge is just this education platform that I use to take people from disadvantaged communities and connect them to the resources that they properly deserve. MIT is the latest culprit, but also, you know, this is a necessity around the world. You know, school isn't this this one dimensional place that you kind of these four walls that we're used to. School is kind of on the move now. So being able to have different ways, different curriculums that are action-based, that are more problem-posing, solution-based, that kids can learn on the fly, learn through internships, learn through moving, and learn through a global kind of connectivity is something that I'm interested in doing with Bridge. For kids who want to be, or parents who want their kids to be involved in this program, how do they find out? Um, they can go to the, the Juice Foundation's website, the Juice Foundation with a seven, juicefoundation.com. Um, as well as social media platforms, the Juice Foundation, on uh, both Instagram and both Twitter and Facebook. Can I ask you one basketball question? Sure. Just one. Okay. Of course, you and Jason Tatum are considered to be one of the most dominant duos in the league right now. Of course, uh, the Celtics had some success last year making it to the Eastern Conference Finals. You guys have had some new faces come, some uh, season vets go. What do you see for the next year? Um, just see, like, opportunity. You know, there's a lot to learn, a lot to improve on. Um, and it's never, you can't take for granted the opportunities that you get. It's a, it's a privilege to be in a winning organization and a winning team. So um, it'll be great to, to bring back the guys and try to make another run. Jalen Brown, we thank you so much. Wishing all the best for you and your organization. Thank you, Lindsay. Appreciate you. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, a fiery hearing on Capitol Hill. The controversial claims a Democratic presidential candidate defended in court. And vehicles are thrown in the air as bystanders run for cover what may have caused this deadly explosion. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now.
This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We've got a lot of news to get to this evening, including the tornadoes, extreme heat, and wildfires taking a toll on millions around the world, from the U.S. to Greece. We're covering it all. Plus, the possible charges against former President Trump that could be handed down any day now as his own aide appears before a grand jury. And the Women's World Cup is kicking off in New Zealand. We're there for a look as America prepares for its first match. But first, First, the severe weather threat and the worldwide weather extremes. Tonight, Greece is just the latest country to face those massive wildfires. We'll take you there in a moment. Here at home, that relentless and dangerous heat is not loosening its grip. More than 100 million Americans currently under heat alerts. That heat is destroying Florida's crown jewel, its coral reefs. Ginger will have more on that in a moment. But we begin with our Trevor Alt in North Carolina, where cleanup is just beginning after a devastating EF3 tornado destroyed a Pfizer plant and rip roofs right off of homes. Tonight, terrifying new video showing the moment the roof peeled off this home. Seconds later, a neighbor's home flying by as that EF3 tornado bore down on families outside Raleigh, North Carolina Wednesday. Packing 150 mile an hour winds. Twister up to six football fields wide on the ground for more than half an hour. In 150 mile an hour winds, some of these homes never stood a chance, and the power lines certainly didn't either. This was a 16 mile path of destruction. You see, there's dozens of vehicles just in this spot. It is a gigantic effort to get the power back on. I'm scared. All of us were scared. Pat Smith was golfing and caught in a cart when the tornado roared through. A tree fell behind us, and then it started falling everywhere, and we just ducked down. You can't really remember much, you know what I mean? You're scared to death. The twister plowing into this Pfizer plant in Rocky Mount. The plant is responsible for producing nearly 25% of Pfizer's sterile injectables used in U.S. hospitals. 
Pfizer CEO tweeting, we are working urgently to determine the best way to get back online as quickly as possible while ensuring the safety of our people. People to look, looking for that to get online quickly are thanks to Trevor. Now let's get right to our senior meteorologist, Rob Marciano. Rob, it feels like this is just Groundhog's Day all over again. You're tracking severe weather for us once again. Yeah, and once again, we have uh, three areas really that are getting hit uh, tonight. The Lindsay, and earlier in the day, it was Michigan, parts of uh, Tennessee, and western Kentucky saw winds of seven, uh, 70 miles an hour, and the cluster now heading towards North Georgia and Atlanta, and then that line going through the Great Lakes. So Columbus, Cleveland, Buffalo, Lookout, Pittsburgh, you'll eventually get it as well as that severe thunderstorm watch extends into central New York and almost all the way to New Jersey as those storms push to the east tonight. Where there are no storms, it will be hot again tomorrow. Jackson, Mississippi to Dallas, uh, Texas, and under extreme heat warnings, 112, the heat index in Jackson, Mississippi, and, and the heat uh, in Phoenix and Las Vegas. Your streak of 110 or better will continue. As for when, we're, when will it end, you asked me this last night, Lindsay, and well, over the next six to ten days, this is what the CPC has put out and <laughs> looks like much of the U.S. is likely to have some sort of heat wave continuing through the end of the month. Lindsay? Wow, looks like everybody except for Seattle there. Rob, our thanks to you. Mm. And as a record number of Americans visit Europe, visit Europe this summer, temperatures there are soaring. In Greece, wildfires are burning in the suburbs of Athens, forcing evacuations. Firefighters from across the continent have come in to help. Our Marcus Moore reports from Athens, Greece tonight. Tonight, the dangerous heat wave spreading across Europe as extreme temperatures fuel wildfires in Greece. We're just outside Athens, where it's been hovering around 110 degrees. They are still very much in this fight, not only from the air, but also on the ground. This fire popping up just a short time ago along this road leading to villages here. We meet Maria Valavani, hurrying to make sure her grandmother was okay. You're obviously worried about them. You were worried about them. Of course. Grandma, they love you. Here. Her grandmother, like so many others here, lost her home, but is unhurt. Atmospheric conditions trapping multiple heat domes across the center of the earth, sending temperatures soaring here in southern Europe. And it's becoming a deadly trend. Scientists estimate more than 61,000 deaths on the continent last summer could have been heat related. Highs now reaching 114 in Spain. In Italy, Sicily hitting 115 degrees in recent days. The usually bustling streets of Sardinia mostly empty. Our thanks to Marcus for that. The temperatures of the ocean are soaring off of the coast of Florida, hitting well over 90 degrees. It is devastating and deadly to the coral and marine life there and could have dire implications for us all. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z has the latest. Tonight, we are diving in off the Florida Keys where the water temperatures are soaring beyond records into the low and even upper 90s on the brink of an ocean heat wave emergency threatening to wipe out Florida's coral reefs. Today, at least 44% of the globe's oceans are in a marine heat wave. We dove in with Carrie O'Neill from the Florida Aquarium to see some of the 200 corals that her team grew in an onshore lab and planted here four years ago. They're working to create new breeds of coral that can withstand higher water temperatures. They had been thriving even two weeks ago, but almost immediately we see it. The coral is now pure white, bleached, a total loss. Immediately when we went in, you saw white. I mean, um, big patches. Uh, as soon as I put my face in the water, my heart dropped into my stomach. Coral reefs are a vital natural barrier against storms. They can absorb up to 97% of a wave's energy, and they are home to countless marine species. If over tens of hundreds of thousands of years these coral have been around, people might say, well, come on, they've made it through plenty of marine heat waves. Not like this one. O'Neill says she won't quit. They will continue their work she worries. We need to take action to stop the warming of our planet or else scientists like myself will just constantly be trying to keep up with it and keep us from losing species entirely. Mm -hmm. What a stark reminder there. Our thanks to Ginger for that. Indictment Watch is on as a special counsel investigates possible attempts by former President Trump to overturn the 2020 election with the grand jury hearing today from a Trump aide who was with him on January 6th. Here's ABC's Terry Moran. 
Prosecutors with special counsel Jack Smith's office arriving this morning at the federal courthouse in Washington as the grand jury investigating former President Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election heard from another witness, current Trump aide Will Russell. In the target letter Trump received from prosecutors, he was given until today to testify before the grand jury himself. He didn't. And so an indictment is likely imminent any day now. Sources tell ABC News that target letter mentioned three federal crimes Trump could be charged with. Conspiracy to commit an offense against or to defraud the United States. Obstruction of an official proceeding. And conspiracy to deprive people of rights. A civil rights law that the Justice Department policy manual says should be considered when addressing schemes to thwart voting in federal elections. Our thanks to Terry. North Korea is warning that the arrival of a U.S. nuclear armed submarine in South Korea could justify them responding with nuclear weapons. It comes as U.S. officials are investigating the circumstances of that American soldier who ran across the DMZ and is now in the custody of North Korea. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz is in South Korea with an exclusive look inside the USS Kentucky. It is this U.S. nuclear-armed ballistic missile submarine now docked in South Korea for the first time in 40 years that is prompting North Korea tonight to issue a dire warning, claiming they now have the legal right to launch their own nuclear weapons. We got an exclusive look at the USS Kentucky, the most destructive warship on the planet. The Navy will not say publicly that there are nuclear weapons on board this submarine, but make no mistake, I am standing on top of hundreds of nuclear warheads. This is our missile control center. The commander taking me inside the missile control center. So this is where nuclear missiles would be launched from? Yes. Recommend grabbing onto this handhold. Then showing us where at least 20 what ballistic missiles are housed, each carrying up to a dozen nuclear warheads. A major deterrence, says the U.S., in the wake of North Korea's nuclear saber rattling. Are you worried about the possibility it could backfire? I am very confident in our own nuclear deterrence. This, while well, tonight, Army counterintelligence investigating the circumstances of Army Private Travis King's decision to bolt across the border into North Korea while on a tour of the demilitarized zone. We don't know his condition. We don't know um, where he's being held. We don't know um, the status of his health. The Pentagon saying they do not have any indication King's border rush was pre-planned with the North Koreans. Martha Raddatz joins us now from South Korea. Martha, that was some incredible reporting from inside the submarine. But regarding the nuclear warning from North Korea, how is the U.S. responding? Well, the U.S. is responding to North Korea's new threat, saying that unlike North Korea's actions, the U.S. efforts to improve the defense posture and protect citizens with that submarine is not in violation of U.N. Security Council resolutions. Lindsay? Martha Raddatz for us, reporting from South Korea. Thanks so much, Martha. The Washington Commanders are no longer owned by Dan Snyder. During a special session, NFL owners voted to unanimously approve the team's sale from the Snyder family to a group led by Josh Harris. The Harris Group is paying just over $6 billion, a record sum for a North American sports franchise. Snyder owned the majority of the Commanders since 1999, and his family became the sole owners after he bought out his limited partners two years ago. Some fireworks today on Capitol Hill as Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who's challenging President President Biden for the Democratic nomination testified at a House hearing about government censorship and took on accusations that he's a bigot. Here's ABC's Mary Bruce. Today on Capitol Hill, Robert Kennedy Jr., the Democratic presidential candidate and son of the Kennedy political dynasty, called by Republicans as their star witness in a hearing on government censorship. I am being censored here. Kennedy, who has espoused bigoted anti-vaccine conspiracy theories, now on the defensive after he was caught on camera saying COVID-19 may have been ethnically targeted to attack certain races disproportionately. COVID-19, there's an argument that it is ethnically targeted. COVID-19 attacks certain races um, disproportionately. COVID-19 is targeted to attack uh, Caucasians and and, uh, and uh, black people. The people who are most immune are Ashkenazi Jews and, uh, and Chinese. Kennedy today accusing his political opponents in the Biden administration of trying to shut him up. 
anti-Semitism, racism. These are, are the most appalling, disgusting pejoratives, and they're applied to me to silence me. But Kennedy's own sister, Carrie Kennedy, is speaking out against him, saying, I strongly condemn my brother's deplorable and untruthful remarks. Still, I, RFK I, I, Jr. today, defiant. In my entire life, I have never uttered a phrase that was either racist or anti-Semitic. But the White House strongly disagrees, calling Kennedy's recent comments vile and saying they put Americans in danger. They say the president will always speak out against these kinds of false claims about Asian and Jewish Americans. Lindsay. Mary Bruce, thank you. Still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, a new campaign forcing women to wear Islamic headscarves in Iran almost one year after the death of Masa Amini. Iranian journalist activist Massey Alinejad joins us to discuss the push from the morality police. But next, the search for a predator. Thousands of people are being told to stay in their homes as officials try to find a missing lion. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from LaGuardia Airport, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. A deadly explosion caught on camera in Johannesburg, South Africa, tossing vehicles in the air and sending bystanders running for cover. One person was killed and nearly 50 injured when the blast tore through a city street during evening rush hour. Authorities are investigating whether a gas leak may have been to blame. The sprawling search continues in and around Berlin for a suspected lion on the loose. Thousands of people in the German capital were told to stay indoors as authorities try to track the big cat on the ground and from the sky. It's unclear where the lion may have come from. There are no reports of animals missing from local zoos, and lions are not native to Germany. The life and legacy of Bruce Lee is being celebrated in Hong Kong. Fans of the late martial arts legend who was raised there laid flowers at his statue and attended special screenings of his films on the 50th anniversary of his death. Lee became a global superstar who shattered stereotypes around Asian actors. He died at just 32 years old after an allergic reaction to painkillers. This week, Iranian forces announced a new campaign to force women to wear the Islamic headscarf, and the morality police are back on patrol a little less than a year since the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini. Joining us now is Iranian journalist, activist, Masi Alinejad. Uh, Masi, thank you so much, as always, for coming on the show. So we were talking last December. There had been this New York Times article that said uh, that Iran was doing away with the morality police. At the time, you said, no, this is propaganda, and now here we are. 
what's your reaction to First here? First of all, thank you so much for mentioning that because I was all over the media mm -hmm. and saying that, no, this is fake news, misinformation, mm -hmm. because the Iranian regime is really good at spreading fake news around and their propaganda was actually misleading the rest of the world that finally uh, the people of Iran, women of Iran being, you know, free, there is no morality police. No, morality police has never gone anywhere. They were there using different tactics. For instance, uh, they put cameras everywhere in the subway, universities, shops, and women were un like unveiled, but identified by the police. Mm. They actually closed a lot of stores who were giving service to unveiled women. Can you believe that? So now they announcing that morality police is back because they have the fear of women to take back to the street, shoulder to shoulder with men in the anniversary of Mahsa Amini, who got killed in the hand of morality police last September. And so now, once again, they're saying that you can be arrested if you don't wear the hijab. There is this mandatory law or face re-education. So this comes as no surprise to you. No, because look, I have been living under this kind of law. Mm. And for me, that's why I was always angry about morality police. We're talking about a regime that they don't have any morale. But they have morality police to harass women in the streets. Imagine, my sister, you go out here in America, you walk in the street, and a bunch of people, a bunch of officers comes to you and say that, oh, you're not properly covered. Oh, cover your hair. Oh, cover your... That's an insult. Or be arrested. You receive lashes. Not only being arrested, don't forget that. Nika Shakarami, 16-year-old, got killed just because of waving the headscarf burning the headscarf in public. And that is frustrating when I see that sometimes some well-known female politician, Western leaders, they don't even get it that we are not fighting against a small piece of class. It is about our dignity. It is about a gender apartheid regime. And now even fighting against compulsory job became a symbol of reg regime change. That's why the Islamic Republic is scared because women became like a nightmare for this regime. ABC News reporter Samaya Malakin has written about some of the various punishments that women face for not wearing their hijab. Among them, uh, she's talked about one woman who had to pay a fine of washing dead bodies in Tehran as a social service. Uh, in another case, a judge told an actress she needed to be referred to a psychological center due to antisocial personality disorder and her need to be seen via breaking norms. At any point in the last 10 months, let's say, would you say that things got better, at least for a short amount of time, or the optics at Not least? at no. all. Look, you see that the numbers of women walking unveiled increased, but that's because women got fearless. It has nothing to do with the Islamic Republic. Why I'm telling that? Because if, according to New York Times, morality police was abolished, mm -hmm. then why women, the schoolgirls, were the target of chemical attack? Mm. Or oh, suddenly they get rid of morality police, but they, you know, poison women? Then why a lot of protesters got executed? So that actually shows you nothing got better. They were busy of oppressing women and men in other way, different tactics. So for me, and millions of people, the things get better when the regime is gone. When like, you know, we are, we want to have a country which became a la become a land of tourism, mm. not terrorism. We want to have a country where like, you, you don't see anyone burning the flag of America. We love to have secular democracy and we deserve that. Masi, what should America or other global superpowers be doing at this point to protect Iranian women? Isolate the killers. Isolate the gender apartheid regime. You know, when I see that the US government are back to the negotiation table, I've been warning for month and month that, uh, you know, Rob Mali, the Iran's uh, US envoy for Iran is not doing enough. Now he's under, you know, the investigation of the FBI. Believe me, we want uh, the American government to support civil society. We want the Europeans to support Iranian women, not negotiating or having a deal with our killers because this is how you empower them to oppress women more and more. Masi Alina Jad, always such an education, so much insight and, and value that you bring to our program when you come on. Thank my you. My dream is to invite you to my beautiful country because mm. you actually gave voice to many voiceless women. And thank you so much.
Thank you, Masi. And still to come, some of the world's best athletes are facing off in the World Cup. How the U.S. women's national team is poised to make history. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. It's one of the most highly anticipated events in sports, the World Cup. Matches are already underway with host countries New Zealand and Australia both winning their first matches, a first ever World Cup victory for New Zealand. Tomorrow, Team USA takes to the field, and the women are aiming to make some serious history. Our Maggie really joins us now from Auckland, New Zealand. Maggie. Hey, Lindsay. Yeah, that win for Team New Zealand really brought World Cup fever to us here down under. Because this tournament promises to be a World Cup like we have never seen before. With a record 32 teams, many countries are here for the very first time. Places like Zambia and the Philippines. But, Lindsay, all eyes remain on Team USA. They are the clear favorites to win it all. Uh, they are here looking to not only defend their title from 2019, they're looking to make history with a three-peat. That's back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back World Cup wins. It's something that no team, men or women's, has ever been able to pull off before. Now, we spoke with some of the players about this added pressure. They told us they're not here to defend their title. They're here to attack the World Cup. They are winners, and they are here to win. Lindsay, we watched some of them during a training session a couple days ago, and you could just feel that confidence rippling off the field. I was. Honestly, I was intimidated by the team, but it is that confidence that's arguably their biggest strength and what might help them just bring this historic moment home for Team USA. Lindsay? They are there to attack. Love to hear that. All right, Maggie, thanks so much. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of the family.